All right, uh, so our talk is about improving the eBPF developer experience with some Rust. Um, so before we get started, uh, just a little bit about uh, ourselves. Uh, I'm Dave, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I'm not a kernel developer. Uh, I've been working on system software in Go for about the last seven years, um, a lot around networking and containers, and I'm particularly excited about eBPF as it allows me to kind of step further down and get more of the kernel goodness, um, but still maintaining some guardrails. Um, and that's probably one of the things which I've enjoyed most about working in a higher level language is the amount of guardrails that are there for developers in terms of all of the static analysis tools and various other bits and pieces. And it's a very comfortable environment to work in. So really, my motivation for this talk and the work that I've been doing is trying to allow developers to succeed with eBPF um, as much as possible. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Alessandro. I work at DeepPants, where we use eBPF for both um, uh, network analysis and observability. Uh, I have been sort of working in the last couple of years in trying to make uh, using eBPF from Rust first class. I added support uh, for eBPF to the Rust compiler. And then earlier this year, I started AYA, which is uh, uh, a new eBPF library that um, we're going to talk about in this talk. Okay, so uh, one of the key things about this talk is developer experience. Uh, so I'm just going to define what we mean about uh, by that first before we dig into some of the more technical details. So my path into eBPF, which feels fairly typical for most people new to the space, is you read a blog post from Brendan Gregg and your mind explodes with possibilities of things that you can do with BPF trace and one line is in perf and you get really, really excited then you find a problem which requires more than one line of code and at which point uh, you have to choose your own adventure uh, which really does feel like you're walking off the edge of the map and here be dragons because the space is very wide and there are a lot of options uh, for you to be able to get started with eBPF from DSLs like BPF trace and system tap through to writing code in C um, and then your user space in another language um, libbpf, bcc there is a whole ecosystem out there, um, but it's not particularly well documented. Uh, best practice is evolving very quickly. And for me, uh, as this systems developer that's used to having all of this great tooling supporting them, what I want is to be able to get moving as quickly as possible so that I don't lose that momentum from having that great idea to kind of getting lost somewhere in, and not being able to make any progress. So, the, the kind of four tenets of developer experience that I'm interested in are documentation. So before I get, uh, before I embark on my project, I want to find out as much as possible about the space that I'm entering, learn what type of program types I'm going to need, understand which map types there are and how I'm going to use those. And at the moment, because the space evolves so quickly, documentation is fragmented. Uh, Facebook's blog, for example, fantastic. Oracle has some good documentation, um, but there is no central place to find that. And unfortunately, search engines are against us here because when you Google something for eBPF, what you'll end up with is a blog post which is four years old as being, you know, advertised as current best practice, um, which as we all know, you know, there's things like BTF, which have uh, been recently added, which have changed things. And uh, we're still ending up following old practices and, uh, you know, undermining the progress that we're going to make from the very get go. Once I've read some documentation, I want to get a development environment uh, spun up as quickly as possible so that I can get my program bootstrapped. Once I've got that environment, then I'm interested in how quickly I can build uh, and test and troubleshoot. I'll write some code, I'll, I'll run it. Does it do the thing I want it to? No, okay. Uh, and, and I will carry on doing that until I, I've kind of exhausted myself and got to a point where my application is working, or at least I think it is. And then finally, I need some tools for debugging. And that can be anything from logging to, uh, at the moment, in most of the examples, is print K. Uh, that's, the, um, uh, that's the state of the art, effectively, uh, as far as I can tell from documentation, uh, which isn't uh, great, uh, unfortunately. Um, so 
given the developer experience was a little bit rough uh, from uh, the, the stuff that I did, um, I was really interested in um, what approaches there could be to uh, to have a, a slightly better experience, something turnkey, where I can stay inside one environment with one tool chain, one language, and uh, be able to kind of work in there uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and it seems that Rust is a, a pretty good choice. So Alessandro, why don't you tell us a little more about uh, why Rust is a good choice for this? Uh, yeah, but first I'm going to say, um, just so everyone knows, I actually love C. I have been running C essentially my entire career. Uh, what is great about C is that it's, uh, it's simple, it's minimal, and it does the job. And uh, maybe surprisingly, I think that's also what I like about Rust. Rust is very expressive, but uh, uh, in a way, it's also very simple for some definition of simple. You can, if you want, you can essentially use it as a glorified uh, C. Uh, it does not have a garbage collector. It does not have any kind of runtime or anything that gets in the way. Uh, you can use it as C with a more powerful uh, type system and also really powerful macros that are way more powerful than the you know, C preprocessor. Um, and probably and most importantly, what, what's, what's best about Rust is all the, um, the tooling that comes with it. Uh, from Rust App, which is the tool that you use to install Rust uh, and including the, the uh, eBPF cross compiler uh, for Rust to uh, Cargo, the package manager, to uh, third-party tools. From starting to building to publishing a Rust project is extremely easy. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, Aya, why did I start Aya? Um, first of all, uh, with Aya, I wanted to create something that was um, easy to use and uh, also very easy to deploy. I started working with eBPF with uh, uh, BCC, and BCC is great. Um, and uh, you know, if you use it with Python and with the, the little DSL with the Clang plugin, it's uh, fairly easy to use. But it's not very easy to deploy. It uh, it uh, requires headers and it requires a bunch of shared libraries at runtime. It's just not a very nice experience to deploy. So uh, one of the goals with Aya from the get-go was that I wanted to create something that would be extremely easy to compile as a essentially self-hosted binary that contained both the user space and the UBF code. And um, yeah, I think we, we actually managed to do that. It's the early days, but I think we're there. Uh, so what is uh, Aya exactly? It's, it's a, not one, but two library, libraries. It's a user space uh, library very similar to uh, LibPF, but uh, for Rust and written entirely in Rust. Uh, it does not use LibPF, it's a complete new uh, implementation. And this obviously has pros and cons. The uh, biggest con is that LibPF is actually great and uh, it implements a lot of features. So by not using it, we're going to have to re-implement all of those, which is not an easy task. Uh, but I think that the, the pros are worth it. Uh, AIA today does not depend on any uh, external code. It does not link to any external libraries. On my laptop, the whole project builds in less than 10 seconds. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't even require kernel headers because most of the bindings are pre-generated. And the ones that cannot be pre-generated, we have tools to, to uh, generate them. Um, and it's a new project, but it already uh, implements most of the uh, uh, map and program types exported by EBPF. It implements uh, BTF, uh, core relocations, function call relocations, uh, and more. There, it's, a, it's a new project, but there's already a lot of features there. And then, as I said, there is also an EBPF side, uh, which is an actual library that you can call from EBPF code. That part is definitely more experimental. Uh, it's something that we are still playing with to kind of understand what kind of API we want to provide. But what it is today is, is uh, it's essentially a high level and type safe API for maps and for um, uh, helpers. And uh, yeah, as we've been saying, uh, ease of use is 
one of the main goals of the, the whole project. And now Dave is going to show you some really cool stuff that he's been working on to that extent. Yeah, so um, you know, with this idealized developer experience in mind, uh, what I wanted to do was to kind of see how far I could get uh, with Aya, which was where you know, my research led me uh, as being a good place to start. Um, so what we do have uh, is some documentation. Um, it's a good place to start. Um, we have a book which runs through uh, a very simple example of how to create uh, an XDP program. Um, and it's you know fully turnkey, um, all inside one programming language, um, with a lot of um, well, with a lot of helpers and guardrails, which you know, I'll kind of go into in a moment. Um, not only that, one of the nice things about Rust is that we have wonderful um, uh, API documentation as well, which is auto generated for crates and hosted up on docs.rs. So. When a crate is published, uh, we have API documentation, which we can kind of click through and read. So as a developer, um, I've got my book uh, and I've got my API documentation, and this is a fairly reasonable place to start. The book we're hoping to expand to kind of cover more use cases uh, and, and examples from things from the community, um, like the various uh, tips that we found with working with trace points and the various pieces. Um, on the second piece for Program Bootstrap, uh, we're using a tool called Cargo Generate. Um, so you can type this into a terminal. Um, you'll get prompted for uh, a project name, choose what you like. Uh, and then you can select uh, from a certain type of eBPF program that you're planning to write. Um, once you've entered all of this in, uh, you will end up with a skeleton project, which is put in place, which covers the build system. So not only can you have you know cargo uh, one command to, to build uh, it will generate um, also uh, the ability to share code so let, let me just show you the project structure um, so you run that command uh, you end up with one module uh, which is for your user space application which you can write in rust and take um, advantage of things like uh, async and all of those fun things uh, you end up with a common package which allows you to only share structure definitions but also code uh, between uh, your user space application and the eBPF side of uh, the application and then finally you get a, uh, a eBPF um, module as well uh, which is where your eBPF uh, program lives um, so uh, all of this all in Rust. Um, one of the things that you will find uh, as you journey through your BPF is that you're going to need bindings to, uh, or you're going to need a Rust binding to uh, something which is in the kernel. Um, and we actually have a tool to do that um, called IAGen. Uh, so you can run this and uh, generate a Rust binding to all of everything inside um, the, the VM Linux uh, BTF uh, type definitions, or just specifically the bits that you need inside the program. Um, and that, again, is all uh, in place for you and covered in the documentation. And then from the, the build and test loop, uh, it's a case of running three commands, one to build your user space, uh, one to build the, the kernel application, and then one to actually run your application. Uh, there is an error on this slide, so uh, don't, don't follow this, uh, follow the book. Um, we have to actually run using sudo here uh, because we need permissions to load BPF programs, which you don't have as an unprivileged user, thank goodness. Um, we're using nightly Rust to build our eBPF program here uh, because we, we need features that are only available currently in nightly, um, but eventually uh, once uh, as the Rust ecosystem matures and the features we need move into stable, uh, this could plausibly be one command as well. All right, Alessandro, do you want to talk about debugging? Yeah. So um, uh, the well, my experience debugging in VBF is that say that you write your code and um, it compiles and it even loads, uh, but it doesn't behave the way you expect it to behave. Um, what you do is you start adding uh, BPF trace print K calls everywhere to kind of try and trace the the, the flow of the program and find your bug if there's a bug and then say you fix it and you have to go back and remove all the print case because you know they are slow and uh, sometimes they are look at, look at stack space so essentially you want to remove them you don't want to actually have them in your production code 
uh, when in cases in which say you need to dump some data that is not supported by the formatting of uh, BPF trace spring K, what you can do is like you create some ad hoc uh, perf event arrays, you dump the data you want to uh, dump to inspect um, to, to a map, you output it to a map and then you write some user space code to extract it and, and you know, print it or inspect it or do whatever to understand why your code is not working. That all can be done, and I've been doing it for a long time, but it's uh, it's uh, pretty inconvenient. Uh, next slide. Uh, one thing we provide with Aria, it's a, it's a separate library for logging. This is not part of the, the main library, so you only get it if you, and you only need to compile it if you want it. But it's essentially an implementation of the um, Rust logging system for eBPF. So it supports uh, different logging levels. Um, it supports string formatting. It supports, it, uh, the formatting is generic actually. You can also implement your own formatting for your own data types. Um, and uh, yeah, this what you see on, on the screen is essentially the whole uh, API. A nice thing about this API is that you can actually leave all these logs in your code and then at compile time, you can decide which levels are enabled. And when you do your final release build, you essentially say, I do not, do not want any levels enabled so that the logging macros expand to nothing. And it's essentially like if the code wasn't there. Uh, next slide. And uh, yeah, IALOG as well comes uh, with uh, both eBPF and a user space side. This is the, what the user space side uh, looks like. Well, user space side is one function call that you uh, call and it will automatically fetch the logs uh, produced by the BPF side. It will route them through the uh, standard Rust logging system and this is what you will get on screen. A nice thing you can see here is that you actually get the file and line location information where the logs were, which is very helpful well, when you're debugging. Okay, so uh, not only have we got a lot of stuff in there already, uh, there are also some plans to add uh, some new new features into Aya. Um, one of the big ones for me is unit testing. Um, so that that build, test, and run loop at the moment requires me to compile my program, load my program, and then verify that it's doing something. Um, now what we would very much like to do is to be able to actually mock out the uh, BPF program context and accesses into maps so that we can run these, uh, we can write tests and have them run on the host architecture. So we've got a good idea that the business logic of our application is actually working as expected. Uh, and then you know, hopefully then we don't need to compile and load into kernel, um, which also means that we could have you know, integration testing or a continuous integration rather running uh, for this without requiring root privileges, um, which should be rather cool. Um, Alessandro? You're muted. Sorry about that. I just wanted to add that uh, that kind of testing, we actually do it for the user space part already. We uh, mock out uh, syscalls so that we are actually able to test the user space API the, for maps, for example, uh, that's already there. So yeah, we just need to start doing it for the eBPF side uh, too. Um, so right now we try to be compatible. So for, for the features that we, implement, which are a subset of the features implemented by libbpf, of course. We try to be compatible with libbpf. Um, the way we test that right now is that occasionally I will test on my laptop that uh, uh, I can load um, programs written in C that target libbpf, that I can load them with AIA. What we're planning to do is to put all this stuff in CI so that we uh, can be reasonably sure that we don't break compatibility too much with libpf. Uh, and then uh, we're going to support more features. Uh, someone is working already on LSM support and uh, I am planning to work on adding more cgroup hooks uh, in the next couple of weeks. We already support a bunch of cgroup hooks and I'm essentially going to finish the remaining ones in the next couple of weeks. 
Uh, one of the other things that there's interest in in the community is uh, using CraneLift to generate uh, eBPF code. Um, so CraneLift is a code generator, which is currently used for uh, generating WebAssembly, and it is written in Rust. Um, there is also a Rust front end as well, uh, so it can compile uh, Rust code. Um, so it's actually being looked at uh, for um, compiling debug Rust code because it's uh, quite fast. Um, so one of the things that we're potentially looking at is could we add an eBPF backend for this? Um, because we feel that it could open up some interesting use cases. Um, so as it's fairly trivial to add a new front end, um, we could add a, a front end uh, for you know a, a scripting language uh, to them very quickly, um, spit out eBPF code. Um, and uh, we, it gives us quite a lot of control over the bytecode, uh, which is generated as well. Um, so it's just something we're potentially looking at. All right, um, at that point, uh, I think that's the, the end of our presentation. Uh, I hope it's been useful to you and uh, we'll, uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, we got some questions in the chat. Maybe let me read them out for you. So sure. first, Brandon Gregg asks, um, if you're aware of the work that is going on in BCC and BPF trace to provide binaries without the need to what the LLVM dependency effectively? Yeah, I, I've seen. Yeah, yeah, I've seen some uh, comments about that, and that is great. Uh, that is great for people that do want to keep using BCC or BPF trace. Uh, but the goal of the project is obviously to create a Rust API to to also do this. So they're not alternatives, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Great. And then the other sort of question slash clarification is, you said that uh, there is a there's a problem of documentation, and uh, Brendan points out that both GCC, uh, BCC, and BPF trace has reference guides, and there's a book that was published by Addison and Weasley. So, yeah. would you like clarifying the, the documentation problems? I I would love to clarify. Um, so I guess there are. Two, two parts in my mind to documentation. There is the documentation of the technology itself. So what, what kernel features for eBPF are there? Uh, how, how do they work and how do they get used? And there doesn't appear to be a centralized source for that as far as I can tell. Um, that, that information is spread uh, everywhere and it's very hard to try and keep up with that. There is also then the documentation for the specific libraries um, and BCC, BPF, Trace do a very good job but they're always going to be lagging behind the kernel features that are available uh, and, and fighting that as well. So it's, it's, it's difficult. B, B, BCC is definitely one of the better examples for sure. Um, I just feel that certainly as a newbie into the space for me, it was, it was particularly overwhelming. And yes, the book is also very good as well. All right. Uh, the third question we get from Brandon is around the well, let me just read it. I'm also curious if you spoke to any of the BPF authors before deciding to rewrite the library. Have you any thoughts on the possible negative impact to collaboration, presumably of not just using the BPF? And how are you keeping up to date with the changes? Yeah. Uh, first of all, maybe it's my fault because I wasn't very clear, but it's not like we we rewrote the BPF, like the API we provide is completely different. There's a, there's already a wrapper uh, for libbpf uh, so that you can use it in Rust. And um, people that do like that, that do like the libbpf API, obviously can use that and it works really well as far as I can tell. But it's, um, as with all APIs that are bindings to APIs written in other languages, obviously some details of the original language leak in the bindings. So obviously in my opinion, um, the API could be better. The Rust API, the LibBPF Rust API could be better. Um, I, first of all, the, the LibBPF um, Rust API seems to be very opinionated, so whoever created that worked on that API obviously likes that API and it's completely fine. I personally think that it's possible to uh, create a more uh, idiomatic Rust API. So that was one of the reasons why uh, I started Aya. 
and also I'm not sure what you mean by the possible negative impacts of uh, to collaboration. The projects are completely independent, and uh, again, it's not like we provide the same API, just a different implementation. It's a completely different API. It's a different developer experience. It's a, yeah, just completely separate. Yeah, and as to how to, sorry, Go just ahead. to finish, how to stay up to date with the VPF changes. Yeah, that's really hard. So yeah, <laughs> that's uh, one of the things we'll have to do for sure. And, and just to, to Alessandro's point about having that idiomatic API, I think that's, that's incredibly important. Um, one of the nice things, uh, especially for me, like I've explained my background is high level languages and system software is a lot of the stuff that Rust has for you as a developer is really, really handy. Um, the fact of the really good IDE integration, the fact of, you know, built in static analysis and all of those things. And I would really love to see that expand to encompass EPPF uh, as well. So making sure that we keep those Rust idioms there is really important. I would also like very much as while I'm developing programs, like Rust does a very good job of stopping me from doing dangerous stuff and avoiding undefined behavior, which is nice. I would very much like to get um, a static analyzer type tool for the verifier plugged into that code as well. Um, and that's something which would be hard, but not too hard to do for Rust because the tooling and the hooks for that tooling already exist. But I, I really want those prompts in my editor while I'm writing of nah, that that's not going to pass the verifier. Um, and I think we, we've got a chance of getting there. All right, we have one more comment in the chat, but I don't think that's actually a question. So Sergey says that in some ways he feels like the BPF system call itself is sort of an internal BPF API. Let's see if anyone else has any questions, either in the chat or just unmute yourself. Hello. All right. Last question, cheeky last question, sorry. Um, thank you for your talk. I, I always um, wondered what it would be like to generate um, code for a language that is not coming from a C front end, not from Clang, and trying to get that to pass the verifier. What is your experience been? Um, I think this is what is great about Rust is that as I said, so if you look at the 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 way we write EPF code with Rust today, uh, essentially we provide strongly typed uh, APIs for say maps, but then once you call those APIs, the code essentially desugars to what you would call from C. So it's essentially exactly the same uh, code. So. Yeah, it's it's not very different, and also obviously the 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 LLVM backend is the same, so it's a uh, it's a uh, not very different. One thing that um, is different is the way the Rust compilation model works, because uh, you know usually when you compile uh, EBVF, uh, when you compile an EBVF program with uh, Clang, you have one compilation unit. Instead, in Rust, you always have multiple compilation units. So that that's the only big difference, but otherwise uh, the code that ends up getting emitted is very similar to what you get uh, with the plan. Good day, this is Brendan. I just wanted to clarify one of my earlier comments, and that's about considering the negative impact. Back when I started with BPF, and I think what made BPF observability and tracing work is that we collaborated together on a few main things. In 2014, there were 14 different Linux traces and everyone wanted there to be one that was finished. And system tap, it worked on Red Hat, didn't work on other distros. There were just problems galore. And if you ask me, what was the one thing that we did right? And that was, we got people to collaborate and work together on BCC and getting that done. 
BPF trace and getting that done. And so it's interesting work that you've done, but I do want to think about you to think about where we're coming from is it's this collaboration that's allowed us to, I think, for the observability space to be so success, successful and take the traces as far as we have. We don't want to go back to having 14 different front ends. There can be other front ends, but there really does need to be a strong use case for differentiation. So just to clarify that comment a little bit, I think it's particularly important based on where we're coming from. I fought a lot of those battles to get people to work together so that we didn't have this multitude of tracer problems again. And so I'm hoping we don't go back down that road too much. That makes sense. Um, uh, I think the part I don't understand is um, people are going to write if you get programs with Rust, right? And unless we say that the uh, libpf Rust API as it is today is the best we can do, we will have to do something else, right? So I think that given the constraint, given the libpf API, you cannot do that much better than libpf RS. I think it's the API looks like that for a reason, right? So I don't think that it's realistic to say, okay, we're going to change libpf so much that it will be able to accommodate a completely different uh, set of bindings for Rust, right? So I really don't see an alternative to having essentially a different implementation. And um, it's, it's not only the, the, what the API itself looks like, it's also, you know, compiling, like uh, Rust as a very uh, solid story for interacting with uh, C code and C libraries. But obviously it involves calling uh, external compilers and linkers and stuff. And uh, that will al always have an impact on, you know, the experience of developing uh, programs, right? Yeah, I, I understand there's a lot of advantages to the Rust libraries. There's going to be uh, shops and environments where people have a Rust ecosystem. They want to add eBPF to that and it totally makes sense for them. Uh, and there's, I don't see a problem with, with that. You're providing the Rust. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a Rust shop and I need to do eBPF. That's what I use. Like if I'm a Golang shop and I need to use eBPF, I'm going to use the Golang staff. It's, right. It's when it comes down to uh, like BPF trace and BCC, uh, that's where we're trying to collaborate to provide the best high level language, BPF trace and BCC for these CAN tools. So we can have the core compile once run everywhere, build these little binaries and, and run them. And so that's like three different use cases I've just mentioned. So you've got, I'm a shop, I'm in a particular language, I need to integrate BPF. If it's Rust, it's this. If it's Golang, it's that, whatever. Then there's the, I want to build some tools, BCC, and then there's BPF trace for that high level language. Uh, so that's, I think they coexist fine that way, but then to start talking about how it's better to write programs in, in Rust over BPF trace. That's where I, where I have an issue with. I think BPF trace is pretty close to pseudocode. Someone might come up with something better than it at some point, but uh, it would be great to talk about that and explore it. But at the moment, I, I think that that model at the moment is, is where, I, where I see them all fit together. The BCC for the tools, BPF trace for that high level language. And then there's going to be these libraries. It's, it's where this, you know, where the, the overlap is, and maybe I'm getting overly worried about it. And that's, that's where I'm, I'm thinking about this kind of substituting BPF trace or BCC when we're trying to collaborate for those particular use cases. Yeah, I, I think it might just be, you know, a, a, a difference in scale, right? And, and what you're trying to do, if you're trying to do simple tracing or something which is very well represented inside the DSL, 
then you know bpf trace and, and bcc th those things might be the right tool for the job i think one of the things that drew me to this approach in particular and using rust was the fact that the problem that i was trying to solve was more complicated than that it was going to be a lot of code i wanted to do that inside an ecosystem which i understood which was rust but also uh, one of the really interesting things about the, the Rust stuff is the crate system. So the fact that we can share code between projects uh, as well and be able to link that in is, is super valuable. So I've got like some packet passing routines, which I, I've got in the crate and I can share those between multiple projects, which for me is a massive time saver. So I, I think as this matures and also as, as, as BPF trace matures, we'll be able to see that there are definitely differences, I think, which might steer people one way um, or the other. Right. So, but do you agree with my, how I'm trying to fit these together in my head where we've got BPF trace is a high level language, BCC for doing these like can tools. And then when it comes to the library ecosystems, you can have a Rust thing for the Rust shops and a Golang thing for the Golang shops. Because at some point I write guidance for beginners and, and I need to get my head around this stuff. So if that sounds good. Yeah, I, I think the, the only thing in my mind, right, is that um, when I started looking at this, the, the thing that really got me was writing. Uh, so BCC is, is great because it, it provides you much more context. If you're trying to do write a BPF program in raw C, just loading into libbpf or loading with libbpf, understanding that is, is a much trickier thing. Um, there, there was a lot of uh, old documentation that was like, you can't use any loops. Uh, in, in your C program, and then it was well, actually, no, you you can, but those loops have to be bounded, and they have to be bounded in this specific way for in order for it to work with the verifier. Um, so you know, for for me, not being familiar with C, that was incredibly daunting, and BP, uh, BCC was certainly less daunting, but still daunting to me. Uh, being able to write programs in Rust for me felt more familiar, and I, I think that there are going to be some people that just prefer that approach. Um, but I'm not sure where that fits into the three layer ecosystem that you provided, you know, either you, you do it in, uh, you, uh, write it in BPF trace, um, or, uh, your DSL or you write in C and then have a user space library, um, or you use BCC through the way. Like, I, I'm not sure where that would fit, but maybe I, I'm just uh, a strange, I have a strange use cases. Yeah. So you I mean, there's going to be some people who. They just want to code in Rust no matter what, and they will find a way and they will write those tools. Uh, but you know, part of our role as a community is to have guidance to say, if you're a newcomer, this is going to be an easier path for you, unless you, for some reason, you really want to do that. Oh no, one hundred percent. Like I think. I mean, just realistically, I don't think it will ever get as easy as using BPF trace, for example, to to start on using BPF. Um, but once you start writing more complex stuff, what Dave was mentioning, like sorry, people keep saying this, but you know, I did write an eight hundred page book, and and I didn't run into an issue once. If I ran into an issue, I went and fixed it, and so the BPF trace had that capability. And so, in, in a way, it does map out what I've needed. But if you are running into specific things, please file issues on BPF trace and we'll see if they can be fixed. Can't do everything. There is going to be stuff times right. when you do need something more complicated. But right. I do push it pretty far. Oh, no, I'm sure. But like one example is, uh, I don't know, if you're like, what we do at work, for example, like network analysis, it's uh, several hundreds lines of code and it interacts uh, a lot with user space, of course, we have, we apply policies and stuff. I don't think realistically we can do that with BPF trace, right? Uh, I'd have to see the program. Um, okay. I mean, BPF trace is an observability tool. If you're talking about policies, then you right. could have entire different algorithms in there. It's, it's something else. Right. And also at that point, then I guess you'd have to ask once you 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 have a program that, that has become say, say several hundred lines of code do you prefer to write that program with the bpf trace dsl or with rust and use the rust language server all the tooling uh, 
you're going to be able to use the, the Rust package registry to just link to libraries and stuff like that. I think for complex programs, realistically, you will need something more powerful. And I think that Rust is, um, in many ways, it, it's a good language because it's, it's arguably an easy language and the tooling allows you to do things that you cannot do with BPF trace today, you cannot do with uh, Clang today. Mm -hmm. So why BPF trace is it, it's an observer it's an it's a narrow use case it's observability yeah, yeah. BPF does a lot more so you can just say like okay for networking stuff we can't do it in BPF trace we need something else that's fine oh yeah I'm so we probably didn't make that clear but I think that it was implied in what we were saying I don't think we're ever going to suggest people to write a two lines uh, EBPF program with with Rust you know and have to install the compiler and uh, create this package and everything. All right, um, there's also a follow-up question from, I think, Daniel, um, about which parts of the libbpf um, RS API do you think yeah. could get most improvement from doing things more idiomatically? Yeah, uh, obviously I am not uh, an expert in libbpf RS. Um, I think the fact that it essentially maps almost one-to-one -one the libbpf API does not look very rusty to me. Uh, for example, if you take a look at AYA, if you take a look at how, for example, uh, perf event arrays are implemented, they support uh, a single weight. They, you know, they support the the they implement the Rust traits so in so that you can at compile time make sure that you don't accidentally use things from multiple threads and stuff like that. That kind of thing is, uh, I think, you know, it, it's one of the reasons why I, I decided to start IAM. All right, uh, Daniel, uh, David, and do you guys uh, have any comments about the RS part, the Rust part, or should we just call it? No one wants to unmute. Hi. Uh, so I just wanted to add like one comment about libpf RS and like not feeling very rusty. Uh, the goal with libpf RS was to reuse the internals of libpf for like all the ELF parsing and to keep the BPF part like completely 100% compatible between, you know, C, C++ and Rust. Uh, if you are feeling some, so like what, what are you talking about, like the traits and the sync stuff, I think that that all can be added on top of that. And that was sort of the goal for libpf RS to provide native Rust uh, abstractions. Uh, we're not there yet because we are not big libpf experts obviously so we would appreciate collaboration and contributions uh, unfortunately you decided to go like completely re-implementing the internals of libpf i mean that's fine the competition is good but uh, as brandon also alluded to right like collaborating and putting all the effort into a single library that would be recommended to users that, that like want to do rust development probably would be more uh, productive overall in the long term We'll see how it goes. All right. Thanks for the presentation and the interesting project. I think we should leave it there. <laughs>